Josh. In more creative, the accepted definition of what a data warehouse is, a non-volatile, time-integrated and subject-oriented data collection that supports management decisions. Compared to the approach of, other, uh, of the other pioneer data storage architect, Ralph Kimball, Inmon's approach is often characterized as a top-down approach. Bill's most recently, uh, recently published book is Data Architecture, a primer for the data uh, scientist, second edition. Bill is the founder and CEO of the Forest Rim Technology, where he has created the world's first ETL textual software that allows reading any form of text in any language and convert it into any standard relational database management system. So we have a great speaker here, and uh, I, I'd like to ask you to, to please welcome Bill Inman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today. Uh, I have to tell you, um, uh, I don't know you don't know this, but uh, when I was 10 years old, I lived in Mexico. And, and uh, so when I come to Mexico, I always feel like I'm coming home. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard about Data Warehouse, uh, but corporations today use Data Warehouse around the world. Uh, and uh, they use them in Mexico, they use them in the United States, they use them Australia, Japan. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, I thought that it might be interesting for you today to hear uh, where Data Warehouse came from. I don't know if you've ever thought about where these things come from. They, do they just come from out of the earth? Does one day suddenly they just appear? And, and the answer is no, that's, that's not how these things happen. Uh, so I, what I want to do today uh, is to tell you the story of where Data Warehouse came from, because that can help you understand uh, how to build and use data warehouses uh, uh, in the future. Building and using data warehouses in the future, uh, for those of you that want a good paying job, is a very good thing to do. Uh, to have the skills of data warehousing is something that corporations pay a lot of money for. And, 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 and for good reason. Um, uh, data warehousing helps corporations make important decisions. So I want to tell you uh, a story today, and the story sounds kind of strange. When you first hear it, uh, you sit there and say, what, what is he talking about? But I want today to talk to you today about something called spider web systems. And you say spider web systems. So when, when you think of a spider and you think of a web, you think of these, these lines that are connected, and, and that's what spiders do to catch their food. Uh, now, we're not really going to be talking about spiders today, uh, but you'll see where spider web systems uh, comes into uh, our, our presentation today. So let's go ahead and get started on our talk today about the origins of data warehousing and something called spider web systems. In order to do this, we need to go back to the very beginnings of the computer profession. Uh, we need to understand a little bit about the history of how all of this, this happened. Now, what I'm talking about, I look across the audience today, and I, I can tell you uh, most of you probably weren't even born when these things were happening that I'm uh, talking about. But once upon a time, in the early days of our profession, uh, there were some things called magnetic uh, tape. And we, we ran computers. This is kind of hard to imagine, but we ran computers with these, these electronic uh, tape things that ran uh, 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 around on a little loop. 
Uh, I don't know if you know it. Uh, it's kind of interesting where that came from. Uh, have you ever seen something called a player piano? <clears throat> that uh, player pianos are these pianos uh, that sit there and play themselves. If you've ever looked inside a player piano, uh, what you find is uh, uh, a, a paper uh, loop that, that controls uh, what keys are played, and that's how they make music. Well, that's actually what they started with many years ago with computers. They started with uh, how we controlled player pianos, and that's how they thought that we could uh, and should control computers. Now, in today's world, you don't see uh, a magnetic tape at all. In fact, the, the last, the only place I, I believe you can see uh, magnetic tape computers is in a museum. I, I, they don't use them in business, and, 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 and again, I'd be very surprised if anybody here has ever seen one or used one. But that was how things began in the beginning. Uh, we had these things called uh, magnetic tape. Now, the, the problem with magnetic tape, or there actually were lots of problems, but the problem with magnetic tape was uh, that it couldn't hold much data that you could only put a very limited amount of data on your, your magnetic tape. So very quickly, they came up with something called punched cards, pun called punched hollerith cards. And these punched hollerith cards uh, were card decks. Now, in some places, you still today, in a few places, can see punched cards. You may, may, may I, I doubt you have them in Mexico, uh, but there may be a few of them left over. Uh, and again, most of them are found in museums. But the idea behind a punched card was uh, you could have this little key punch machine uh, and you punch these holes in a card and these holes in a card were read into the computer. And, and you could uh, have much, much more capacity with punched cards than you ever had with magnetic, uh, uh, with, uh, with, 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 uh, uh, with tape, with paper tape. Uh, and then one day they discovered that these things called punched cards had a lot of problems as well. First off, they were actually quite expensive, number one. The second thing about punched cards that uh, uh, was kind of a problem, uh, if you and, and this happened to me and it happened to everybody that used punched cards, you're walking down the hall with a deck of punched cards like this and somehow you drop it. Well, when you drop the punched cards on the floor, you then have the problem of picking them up and then resequencing them. And resequencing them in the right order was something that was not a lot of fun. Uh, but uh, uh, so, however, uh, these punched cards were uh, an improvement over the paper tapes that we had. And then along came something called magnetic tapes. Uh, and, and, and again, now you, you will see magnetic tapes today. They're still used today. Uh, there are these tape drives that sit there and spin around and spin around. And the uh, thing about magnetic tape uh, is magnetic tape is inexpensive. Uh, you can hold lots and lots of data on it, and it was an improvement over punched cards. But even with magnetic tape, there was a lot of problems. The problems with magnetic tape is, or the major problem with magnetic tape is, that in order to read one record, you had to read the whole tape. And, and it's an expensive, time-consuming process to have to spin and read the whole tape to go find one record. And so this is what uh, computing looked like in the, uh, the early days. Uh, when, what am I talking about here? Uh, the 1960s, the late 1950s and the 1960s, this is what computing uh, looked like. Uh, and then the next thing you know was 
uh, we began to build applications. We, we, we found that uh, with paper tape and uh, magnetic tape, we could build these things called applications. And so uh, we, we started to build applications. Now, now, these applications that we built in the early days were actually quite powerful things because you see what the computer was doing, the computer was replacing people doing work. If you didn't have a computer doing it, you had to have people doing it. And in terms of the cost and the accuracy and a lot of reasons, trying to do things manually was was a, a difficult, uh, uh, awkward uh, task, something you didn't want to do. So uh, as, as awkward as we think that uh, as crude as we think that uh, magnetic tape and, and cards were, they were still an improvement over whatever was the option in that day and age. So we started to build these things called um, uh, uh, applications, and we found that applications were good. And, and we found that we could build them, and we started to have lots and lots of applications back in uh, the 1960s. Uh, but we soon discovered uh, that these things called magnetic tapes started to get out of hand. There started to be lots and lots of these magnetic tapes. And, and, and uh, uh, th there were so many that, 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 that people's brains began to burst uh, because of trying to keep track uh, of, of these magnetic tapes. And so along that line, uh, we found that uh, the next improvement in technology was something called disk storage, magnetic disk storage. Now, that's what most of you have probably seen. And when people think about the computer today, uh, what they think about is magnetic storage. That's, that's what... 99% of the world uses today in one form or the other, and that's what you're probably the most familiar with. Uh, but there was this, this preceding technology that, uh, that existed before uh, magnetic uh, 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 disk storage, and, and uh, uh, you need to know about that. So one day we began to have this thing called disk storage. Now, the thing about disk storage was, is that the, the improvement, the, the major improvement, is that in order to find one record, you didn't have to go look at the whole thing. That with, with, with tape storage, you had to do that. But with uh, magnetic storage, you can go in and find a given record without having to search the whole file for your records. And this began to be a very uh, good thing for people to do and for uh, uh, the world in general. Uh, direct access storage device, D-A-S-D, D DASD, as it's sometimes called, direct access uh, storage device. And so these things were, for, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate that. Uh, these things were very powerful, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the cost of storage started to drop. In the early days of magnetic storage, uh, of disk storage, uh, the cost was actually quite high, and the capacity was actually quite low. But over time, we began to be able to manufacturers to make disk storage very powerful and very inexpensive. And so uh, because of the power and inexpensive uh, 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 forces at work, uh, uh, that's why uh, disk storage came into play. Well, along about the time uh, that disk storage came into play, uh, there began to be something else that was out there. Uh, we discovered that we needed some technology called a database management system, DBMS. Now, what the database management system did for us was for it, it allowed us uh, to go in and manage the data on disk storage. 
uh, uh, and and it, it, it provided a lot of services that the programmer would otherwise have to do. And so soon there was this thing called uh, uh, DBMS, uh, Database Management Systems. And, and, and that, too, was a great improvement in terms of the, the evolution. I'm describing today for you an evolution that has occurred. And in terms of the history of how technology has uh, come, this, this is something that uh, uh, you ought to know. Every student of computer science ought to know a little bit about the history of how all of this happened around the world. And so anyway, we had these things called database management systems. And it wasn't long after we had database management systems uh, that we soon started to have something called online database management systems. Now, now, this is an interesting thing happened when we started to have online database management systems. Uh, because we could go in and access the data directly, we could, we could then start to entertain doing something called online transaction processing. Now, everybody in here, whether you know it or not, has been a user of online transaction processing systems. When you go to the bank, how do you think the bank teller knows how much money you have in the bank? When you go to an airline and you want to make a reservation for a, a trip to go somewhere, how do you think the, the airline knows how to uh, uh, build your system? That, 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 that the, this thing called transaction processing systems changed the way business was conducted. That suddenly, one day, we could do things with transaction processing systems that we couldn't do things before. And business, it was, it was, it was uh, 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 like, like uh, milk to a baby. But suddenly, business couldn't live without this thing called transaction processing systems. And we have them today. Uh, airlines have them. Banks have them. Manufacturers have them. Uh, they exist in lots and lots of places today. And, 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 and how do they exist? At the heart of being able to do transaction processing systems is the whole notion that we can go get data directly. If we had to sit there and spin through a whole file uh, to run a transaction, we never would have had transaction processing systems. So the next thing you know was we started to have these transaction processing systems, and they were very important to business itself. You know, for those of you that are students starting your career out there, um, <laughs> Uh, you want to know how to make money? You want to know how to succeed? Get yourself a skill that business really needs, and they will pay good money for what you do. That, that, that is, it's as simple as that. And learn something that somebody needs, and, 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 and you're on your way to becoming uh, uh, an important, uh, uh, wealthy business person. Uh, which is a, a good thing to strive for. So anyway, we began to have these things called uh, uh, these applications, these transaction processing uh, applications. And uh, the next thing you know was these applications started to like sprout like the Hakaranda in springtime. That suddenly they were everywhere and, and, and I mean, they, they, they were all over. And, 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 and people thought that was a really good thing. Now, you would think that your end user would be happy with all of this. Uh, but end users are funny people. Let me tell you a little secret. End users are never happy. That whatever you give them, that, that, that they find something else to want. That's the nature of being an end user uh, in the world. And that's another little secret that you need to learn. 
But anyway, so the end user began to have all of these applications put together. And the next thing you know, something happened. The end user said, oh, you know something? I've got this, this application over here. I need some data from this application off over here. And this person over here in this application, they need data from here. So uh, uh, when we built the application, we didn't know we were going to need this data. But now that we have the data, we know that we need it. So, so I needed to ha start to have information to be shared across applications. Now, you wouldn't think that that would present a problem. But it turns out it, present, it presents a really profound problem. Uh, and, but how did we solve that problem? You say, well, gee, Bill, I've got an application over here, and I've got another application off over here. Uh, why don't I just write a little program to, to go find the data, take the data, and put it off over here uh, uh, in this application? Isn't, it, isn't that a simple answer? Uh, uh, and the answer is, yeah. And that's exactly what we did. And it turned out that that's a very naive answer. It turned out that there were some, um, some things that happened when we did that that were, were, were evil. Things that, that, that we had some consequences we didn't understand. And we'll get to that in just a second. So, uh, we see then that we have these applications. Now we need to sh start to share data across the applications. And we build these things called extract programs. And so we build these extract programs. And uh, the next thing you know is, is these extract programs begin to appear everywhere. They, 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 uh, it, it, if, if, if you think the springtime has got a lot of hakarandas, the springtime has got even more weeds than, than, than nice flowers and trees uh, uh, coming out. And, and so this is what the world started to look like. We started to have, and, and this is actually an architecture. It's not a very good architecture, but it is an architecture. And so th this is what happened in the world. And now, where did this happen, by the way? Did this happen in one corporation? It happened everywhere. And it didn't matter what kind of business you were in. You could be in manufacturing. You could be in consulting. You could be in retailing. You, it didn't matter what you were in. This is what everybody did. This is the way systems evolved and, and, the, and what the world looked like. And so we st started to find out that, gee, Bill, uh, these, these uh, uh, extract programs, our, our user said they wanted data to be moved from here to here. And we gave that to them. Uh, uh, but you know what? Our end user still isn't happy. Our end user still has got problems with, with things. Again, again, you have to understand that end users are never happy people. That's, 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 it's true. I'm, I'm telling you the gospel truth. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Mexico, United States, Canada, England, doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. End users are people who are never satisfied. And sure enough, this moving of data from one application to the next did not satisfy the end user. Uh, and the end user was unhappy for a lot of reasons. So the end user decided that the next thing they were going to do was to bring their personal computer into the organization. So instead of having all of these systems built by the IT organization, they brought in their personal computer. And there was some other technologies. There's some technology called 4GL technology that came along. Uh, uh, and there were a wide variety of other technologies. But the next thing you know was the end user wanted to have control of their environment. They didn't like it that the, the IT department was controlling where everything was. And so, um, uh, so this is, uh, this is how it happens. Now, I don't know if you recognize this. What does this kind of look like? 
this kind of looks like a spider web. This is how kind of spiders build things. They put in one line here and one line here. And the next thing you know is you've got this big spider web. So this is where uh, spider web systems come from. And, and what's wrong with spider web systems? Uh, the thing, there's actually there's a lot of things wrong with spider web systems. But what's wrong with spider web systems? The main thing that's wrong with spider web systems is something called data integrity. And you say data integrity. I, what, what, what do you mean by data integrity? Well, it turns out that data integrity is something that's very important. Because you see, what happened is, is the organization ends up not with data, but with lots of data. And they've got the same element. Let's take your bank of balance. Now, your bank balance in this environment, in one place, you've got 4,000 pesos in your bank account. You've got 40,000 in another place. You've got 20,000 in another place. Wait a minute. So wait a minute. That's not right. At any moment in time, there's one and only one value. And, and except that in a system like this, you've got multiple values. And, and, and try making decisions in an environment like this. It's not a matter that you don't have data. It's a matter that you have data that you can't believe. That's what we mean by data integrity. And so uh, uh, it's this whole notion that uh, with this, spy this evolution of spider web systems, uh, again, which everybody on this earth, uh, uh, ha I have to tell you, in today's world, there's a lot of organizations that, that have, have not overcome, but have learned to master this environment. On the other hand, there's a lot of organizations on this earth that are still living in this environment right here. And this, this is a miserable environment to live in. There's, this, I used to live and work in this environment, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's no fun because because you're in a position. Have you ever played a game where you can't win? You know, if you're going to play a game, at least you need to have a chance of winning, and that's part of why we play games. But but if if there's no chance of you winning. <laughs> Games cease to be a lot of fun when you can't win. And when you are trying to work and live and become a professional in this environment here, guess what? You can't win. And, and, and it's not, it's not pleasant. It's not a, not a good situation to be in. Now, now let me point out something else that's, that's kind of, kind of unique about this spider web environment that we have here. How did organizations go about uh, trying to solve this problem? What did vendors tell them to do? Vendors said, you need to buy more software. You need to buy more hardware. You need to bring in more people. Now, do you know what this is like by, by, by trying to increase this environment? Do you know what this is like? This is like going to a fire. You've got a building that's on fire, and you want to put the, the fire out, and you've got a pail of liquid, and you throw the liquid on, except instead of throwing water on the fire to put it out, you just threw gasoline on the fire, and it gets even bigger and worse. That's what happens uh, when, when you try to uh, put uh, resources, computers, software, and people added to this environment make things worse, not better. And, 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 uh, uh, and, 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 and that presents some real problems. Anyway, so this, this is what we mean by spider web systems. These are some of the problems associated with spider web systems. I've got one slide coming up right here. This, folks, is a spider web system. This, this is taken from an organization called AT&T. Uh, they're a telephone company in the United States. Uh, 
and and see see those little black dots there? Do you know what those little black dots are? I want, I want to point them out. See this black dot here and this black. You know what these are? These are applications. And do you know how many people this are, may be supporting that application? In some case, three and four hundred people are behind each one of these black boxes. This represents uh, the, the work of about 10,000 people uh, trying to work together. Now, how would you like to try to make an intelligent decision based on this data? Because you see, you, because you've got a piece of data, you don't, you've got data flying everywhere. You have no idea what right, correct, data is. And so in terms of trying to make a decision, uh, uh, I'm not going to use the word impossible lightly, but it is impossible to make a decision based on this architecture. Can't be done. I don't care who you are and how smart you are. Can't be done. And furthermore, adding more hardware, more software, and more consultants makes matters worse, not better. So this is what a spider web system is. Uh, what we need here is not more technology. We need a change in architecture. We need to rethink how we construct this environment and how we make decisions. And this is where Data Warehouse came from. Data Warehouse came from this architecture, uh, the spider web systems architecture, and Data Warehouse uh, 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 is the architectural solution that we have for taking this environment and turning it into a rational environment. Into where I, I mentioned winning it a game. Nobody likes to play a game they can't win. Well, by, by starting to change the architecture, you now have a game that you can win. That, that's what it is. So this is, this is where Data Warehouse came from. This is why we build data warehouses. This is why organizations um, um, uh, need to go, to, or, or not need to go, or go to Data Warehouse. Now, who doesn't like this uh, notion of a data warehouse? You might be surprised. Uh, the people that don't like data warehouse were the vendors, the hardware and software vendors to say, wait a minute, you're coming in here and selling this thing called data warehouse. I want to go continue to sell them more and more hardware and more, and more software. And, and, and uh, 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 so vendors didn't like this architecture at all. So this then, when you start to study and learn about Data Warehouse, and I advise you to do that because, because corporations will pay you a lot of good money to understand architecturally what you're doing, uh, 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 you need to understand how all of this came about. Okay, that's the little presentation I wanted to do for you today. Uh, I'd be more than happy to um, answer questions or talk about. There's a lot of other subjects that are out there. I'll be more than happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions, please? Wait for the microphone, please. Um, hi, well, I can see that there is a grid there. What is the meaning of the columns? What's the name of the what? What is the meaning of the columns? The columns, the, the each, okay. These are applications. These lines are the data flowing from one application to the next. That, that's, that's what's going on here. This is the flow of data across the large organization. Okay, so, well, I understand that, but I can see that there are like straight lines. 
like or vertical straight lines that are you talking about you talking about these lines here yeah yeah that the, that's just the uh chart that at&t drew to put all of this together oh, okay. there's no meaning involved there well, thank you thank you Hi. Hi. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, as like with your years of experience, um, what companies do you think that have a uh, very good uh, structure with the, 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 the data warehouse? Um, that's a good question. Um, um, I first off, I, I I can't speak so much for Mexico. I've done some work down in Mexico here, uh, but uh, uh, I don't. I'm not that familiar with your corporations here. However, I can speak for the United States. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, a lot of banks have got good architectures. Um, me think um, some manufacturers have got a very good architecture um, some airlines have got a good architecture so so those are the airlines banks um, and manufacturers have probably the best ones I, 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 I regret to say insurance companies, at least the ones I'm familiar with, don't have particularly good architectures. Um, oh, I, okay. Uh, I can think of a couple of oil companies uh, the, 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 that I know have got very good architectures uh, in, in, in Shell, Shell United States and Shell Canada uh, uh, come to mind. So... Uh, so anyway, uh, I hope that answers your question. I have another question. Uh, sure. Yes. Um, I'm starting. I'm starting studying, and I'm. I'm my. I'm my. Ah, sorry. I'm always asking what should I special specialize my field of study. So I was uh, yesterday. I don't remember what day, but I was thinking, in your years of experience, what. Field, do you think that is most competitive? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I'm thinking cryptography or data science. I, I'm. I really don't know what to choose. Okay, you asked a question. I'll, I'll give you an answer. Uh, if I were you, and I were looking to be very successful in business, uh, I, I, I would look in in a strange place. Uh, I say strange because people aren't going there. Let, let me let me let me tell you a little story. Um, in the history of the United States, in 1848, you could go to the state of California, and this, I'm not joking. You could walk into the streams of California and pick up gold. You you could walk over there. Here's some gold here. Here's some gold here. And then you could in 1848. And then in 1849, word got out that there's gold in California that you can just walk along and pick up. And all of a sudden, half the United States charged across the United States to get to California because everybody wanted to go pick their pick the gold up. And, and there's gold out there today. Uh, and it's actually, if you know where to go, and, and how to do it, it's actually easy to pick up. And that gold is in text that uh, if you take a look at the world of corporations, corporations today, 99.9, .9, all of them, all of corporations today don't pay any attention to text. And, <clears throat> and, and it turns out that there's a wealth of information in text that can be mined and sold. That's where the gold is today. And and uh, uh, so uh, uh, if I were you, I would learn what I could learn about how to go into text. You say, okay, Bill, 
tell me where it's at. Where, where, give me some examples. Don't just tell me about gold and that, that sounds interesting. Give me some examples. Okay, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one really simple example is corporate contracts. Did you, let me tell you a dirty little secret. Did you know that no corporation anywhere in this world knows what's in their corporate contracts? That, that you go to the, I've stood in front of executives around the world and I said, okay, uh, Mr. And Ms. Executive, uh, you know, you know, is there anybody in here that knows what's in their corporate contracts? And to date, not one person has ever stood up and said, oh yeah, we know what's in our corporate contracts. Corporations have no idea what's in their corporate contracts and, and it's, and it, it, it potentially can cost them millions of dollars. And so, so, so let me tell you something. Being able to go into corporate contracts, take those corporate contracts, turn them into a database, uh, uh, and then show the corporation what important information I have news for you that there's gold in doing that. Let me tell you another place where there's gold. Uh, we have in the state, uh, I'm sure you have in Mexico, I don't know the format, but in the United States, we have something called the 800 number. The 800 number is a number uh, that you can get on the phone, dial 800, uh, uh, and call a corporation. And you can call IBM, you can call the, the bank, you can call any corporation out there on their 800 number. Uh, uh, and then, and then you can ask questions. You can ask to buy something. You can ask, you can say anything you want on the 800 number. Do corporations know what is being said in the conversations with the corporation? The answer is they have no idea. They can't tell you what's being said. And, and, and yet, the people that are talking to their corporation and the 800 number, uh, those are the people that 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 that, uh, that they ought to be. The corporation ought to be listening to. So, so you want them. You want to know where the gold is? Go to corporate contracts. There's gold there. Go to the 800 numbers of the corporation. There's gold there. Let me tell you another place where there's gold. Another place where there's gold is the internet. If you go out to the internet. There are site after site after site on the internet where uh, people uh, talk about an airline or a bank or a, a, a soccer team. I don't know. They talk about everything in the world on the internet. And yet, how many corporations know what people are saying about them on the internet? And I can give you some really interesting stories about how important it is to know what's being said on the Internet. But corporations don't know that. So you want to know how to make a lot of money? Go out to the Internet, take that information on the Internet, put it into a database, and then go tell a corporation uh, uh, how would you like to know uh, what people are saying about you and your corporation on the Internet. That's where the gold is. And so there's, like I said, it's like California in 1848. Today, you can walk along the streams and just pick up gold, just, uh, real gold. Just say, hey, here's a look in this over here. And, 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 and you can do that today. Now, 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 uh, in 1849, that changed. The world the whole the United States shifted from the East Coast to the West Coast because everybody wanted to go find that gold. But right now it's 1848 and people, uh, that gold is just sitting there waiting, waiting for you. That's where the opportunity, that's how to get rich. In, 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 and if I were a student, that's what I would be looking at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get rich, come give me some of it, okay? Of course. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, how do you actually approach companies and convince them that you are creating value for them? Because there are some companies that might not be able to see how, how this process is uh, like taking care of some of their jobs. And well, that's, that's the first question. And the second one is about how, um, how to jump the, the barriers between academy and bringing like a lot of technology that is actually um, 
being used in some academic projects, but not in the industry. I, I'm not sure I understood your question, but uh, let, me, let me try to answer it anyway. Um, um, if there is a secret to getting people's attention is don't focus on the technology. Focus on business value. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you come from the academic environment or where you come from. If you can satisfy business value, you, you, you're going to get attention in the, in the real world. So I, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure I, I'm, I didn't, I don't think, I'm not sure I really understood the question. So my, but I, that's good advice anyway. Good, thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Haven. Uh, currently, we have a ETL process no? yep. in, in Darwin House. But in another, in another time, when we had this kind of a, a spider, uh, yep. what about the validation info, about the information? When arise the ETL process? OK. Uh, when Data Warehouse first started in the early, early days, uh, we did the ETL process by hand. We had an army of programmers sitting there writing it out. And then we realized these programmers are essentially writing the same program over and over again. They're taking data from one place, integrating it, moving it somewhere else over here. And, and that's where ETL came from. Um, uh, uh, we couldn't do data warehousing today without ETL as an industry. It's its own, it's its own industry uh, that's out there. But, but in, in the early days, <clears throat> when, this, when this diagram uh, was built, this is a real diagram, by the way. I didn't make this up. This is, this is a real company with a real diagram. Uh, when this diagram was built, and we were telling people to go build data warehouses, uh, in that day and age, there was no ETL, and and today there is ETL, and we can do all kinds of things because of ETL that we couldn't do in the early days. Thank you. Mm -hmm. ETL is an, an enabling technology. Another question? Yes, please. I think uh, it's possible to use a data warehouse in production or is just for analysis. I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm old and I don't hear all that well. <laughs> okay, it is possible to use a data warehouse in production or it is just for data analysis? Um, the whole purpose of, 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 of data warehouse and ETL is data analysis. I mean, th th that's, that's why we do this. Now, I purposely didn't make a lecture today about data warehouse. I wanted to tell you where it came from, but there's still a lot to be learned about what is a data warehouse, how is it used and whatever. But in answer to your question, a data warehouse is to use, be used analytically, not for operational purposes. That's the appropriate use of a data warehouse. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I have another question, Bill. Sure. I'm, um, thank you very much for your talk. It was very Certainly. interesting, enlightening. I'm uh, I'm very sorry to say that I did experience the uh, <laughs> the card the punch cards <laughs> and uh, and relate to to the uh, to how data uh, has changed along the years. We are currently seeing that the the uh, number of data is growing in an exponential number, and not only is it's data is all uh, not only is structured data, but we also have images, we have text, we have speech, we have other kind of of, of information that somehow become data. Yep. And on the other hand, we have also the problem of, of cyber security um, and, and this kind of thing. So in, in this new uh, scenario of, of this 
days. What, what are the challenges of data warehouse? <laughs> <laughs> um, data warehouse remains uh, as long as there's a need for integration of data, data warehouses remain uh, essential to the corporation. Now, as you were talking, you made mention of the fact of the, the growth of data. Uh, and first off, you're absolutely correct. N no question about that. But there's something else that's occurring. The As data grows, business value does not necessarily grow along with it. Some data is much more rich in business value than other data. And, 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 uh, uh, Somebody, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, um, uh, I, I, I don't have a good example. Uh, I've got some examples that are very complex and confusing. I'm not even going to talk about them. Uh, but but, but the, the truth is, is that the closer you get to business and business transactions, the greater the chance that there's business value there. The further you get removed from business and business transactions, uh, the less chance that there is business value there. And so uh, the, the vendors of technology want you to believe that with big data and with all of these information, IoT uh, things that people are talking about now, uh, that business value is going to be there. What people are finding, I mean, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, there is a company in the United States uh, that's a public utility, and and they spent ten million dollars, which is still a lot of money. On 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 the, their vendor told them uh, to go out and look at every customer, and every time the customer. Uh, 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 turned their thermostat up for their utilities, electricity and gas utilities. So they spent $10 million uh, looking at uh, putting this database together of, 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 of all of this data about customers and, and, and things. And what they found was that as the temperature gets colder, people want more heat. Well, a sophomore in high school could have told them that. A, a, a housewife, you didn't need to spend $10 million to find out that when it gets colder, you need to put more heat on. Uh, but, but that's exactly what they did. And, and, and there's a Bank of America. Uh, spent a huge amount of money uh, putting all of the checks that people write. Can, can you imagine how many checks Bank of America processes? Huge number of checks looking for patterns of business value. There was none. They couldn't find any, any there. So just because you've got a huge amount of data does not mean that you've got a huge amount of business value. Anyway, that that was that thought crossed my mind as you were talking, but it, is data mushrooming and growing? Yes, but business value is not necessarily growing along with it. Thank. You. Is there any other question? Okay, if not, uh, I want to thank Bill Inman for this interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank I you. I want to present you with this. Testimony of your oh, interesting thank you. conference. I'll put it on my wall. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Gracias a todos por por su presencia, por su atención. Gracias a todos.